All right, so I know that at the beginning of class here, I gave you another something kind of chanty to listen to. Um, it had to be a version of the Iliad because every version of the Odyssey that was on offer on YouTube being read in ancient Greek had like this goofy New Age music behind it. Um, and I figured I'd rather you just hear the words. Um, so I've been trying to give you a sense um, of what some of the ancient languages that these texts were originally written in sound like. Right, we did the same thing with the ancient Hebrew last time. Um, you know, we'll probably, when we get to, uh, say, Ovid, um, you know, try to hear things in Latin. I will definitely also be playing um, the Hindu epic, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, for you in, uh, in Sanskrit. Um, so, just to give you some sense of what these sound like in the original. Okay, so how many of you are already on some level familiar with the Odyssey? Okay, how many of you have actually um, read the Odyssey or parts of it before? All right, good. And how many of you have just seen a movie? Okay. <laughs> there was a TV movie uh, in the 90s um, that I, I have learned since some high school teachers uh, use as a substitute for actually having students read the book. So, right. So let's talk a little bit about what you already know about this character. We already know about Odysseus, we already know about this particular epic. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys already know about Odysseus? Is Odysseus a demigod not like really, Gilgamesh? No, not like him. <coughs> but he's, but he's, no, he's not the son of Zeus, right? Is Odysseus the son of any god or goddess? No. He's favored by certain gods and goddesses, right? But he is himself fully human. Right? He is relatively unusual among epic heroes in the ancient world in that he is fully human. He's not a demigod. He has, you know, no real trace of divine blood. Right? He's a king. He is in command of a company of men, but he is not a demigod. What else do you know about Odysseus already? Um, he wants to return home. That's basically what the... Yeah, the whole point of the Odyssey, the whole point of the epic, is what the, Greek, the Greeks called Nostos. And nostos means return. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the word nostalgia? Okay, yeah. What if, if you're feeling nostalgic, what does that mean? You want to go back to past feeling or past experience. Yeah, a feeling of nostalgia comes over you. It's like, like for me, like I, I see. Um, like cartoon characters that I remember from when I was a kid in the 80s, right? And a wave of nostalgia washes over me because it returns me to that feeling of being a child again, right? It's this, uh, this, this is the root word for our word nostalgia, nostos, return. And that's what this epic is primarily concerned with, is getting Odysseus home. But usually when we talk about epic, as a genre, are we talking about anything so simple? Why do none of these markers ever work? Are we usually talking about anything so simple as just getting one guy back to his relatively unimportant little island? No. It's usually, it's not this, oh, I want to go home. I've got this journal, it's a whole bunch of other like, little side. Stories. Right, and I think with the little side stories here, the little sort of deviations from Odysseus's uh, homeward quest, what that suggests is that like Gilgamesh and like Genesis, this is in some sense a composite text, right? 
It's, it draws on a number of earlier stories, earlier traditions that may not have originally been related to each other, but are then sort of compiled into a continuous narrative by Homer, whoever that was. And that's one thing to note here is that we actually know almost nothing about the poet Homer. Um, <clears throat> What, are, what do we think we know about Homer according to legend? Like, you know, what does folklore tell us about the poet Homer? Anything at all? Yeah, according to folklore, he was blind, right? But we really can't say whether the poet who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey was actually blind. Um, we can say that we think both of these poems were written by the same person around the same time uh, because there are sort of features of language that are quite similar. We can also say with some certainty that the poet who wrote these poems was from the eastern edge of the Mediterranean world, that he was not from mainland Greece, um, that he probably lived in what is now um, western Turkey where there were Greek colonies and Greek settlements. The reason we believe this is because the geographical features of the Iliad, which takes place in northwestern Turkey, are very, very, very specific. You know, specific enough that in the 19th century, an amateur German archaeologist named Heinrich Schliemann was able to follow clues in the Iliad to find mm -hmm a buried city that we think is the location um, of you know, Homer's Troy. The geography of the Odyssey, on the other hand, is all over the place. Um, once Odysseus leaves the sort of region around western Turkey, we have no idea where we are most of the time. Like most of the geographical locations in the Odyssey don't match up to real world places. Um, even Odysseus's own island of Ithaca, um, we're not really sure. There, there is a Greek island that's called Ithaca, but we know it's not Odysseus's Ithaca. Uh, we have no idea where the hell Odysseus's island would have been. So this is what we know about Homer. Now, to get back to the idea of epic, right? When we talk about an epic, um, some of you were shouting out some things you associate with the word epic. What's an epic? What is an epic concerned with? A major journey or story. Okay, yeah. A sto story is an important element of this, right? An epic is always narrative, right? We're not talking about lyric poetry that's meant to evoke moods or feelings, right? We're talking about narrative. We're talking about a continuous story. So it's always narrative, sometimes but not always about a journey. What other common features um, is an epic supposed to have? Like the hero, but he's supposed to like undergo um, some sort of transformation. Or... Okay. Trials and transformation. of a hero. One thing that you may not be aware of that an epic is generally about, usually it's concerned in some sense with civilization building or with or restoring. Right, so if we think back to the Gilgamesh epic, right, the whole idea, the whole narrative thrust there is to get Gilgamesh to stop running around in the wilderness with his buddy killing monsters and searching for immortal life and to settle down and become a real king to his people. The whole point of the Iliad, the companion piece of the Odyssey, is to restore 
Achilles to the army, right? He, he is uh, retreated to his tents in a snit at the beginning. And to, rest the, to restore Helen, the kidnapped wife of the Spartan king Menelaus, right? The purpose of the Odyssey is to restore Odysseus to his kingdom so he can put it back in order. Right, it's been taken over by these um, you know, suitors who are chasing after his wife, drinking all of his wine, eating all of his livestock, and plotting to kill his son. So his, his island, his kingdom, is in chaos while he's gone. So the whole point of this is to get the king back to his island to put things back in order. So epic is about either establishing or restoring the proper order of things. And that's what distinguishes an epic typically uh, from just a long narrative poem. Okay. So... How did this uh, how did this reading go for you? Was there anything that particularly confused you or that particularly stuck out to you? Calypso, like keeping Odysseus for so long. Okay, well that wasn't actually part of the portion that I asked you guys to read. Right? Uh, it was just I'm book thinking, six to eight. I'm sorry, I'm thinking I probably read too much. Yeah, but I mean, okay, it is important though to consider what Odysseus has been up to before he washes up on this particular shore, right? Yeah, we know he's been a prisoner of a goddess called Calypso who has kept him for a decade on her island. Basically as a kind of sex slave. Right? She keeps him there because she lusts after him. And she wants him to, it's, it's kind of like an Ishtar Gilgamesh situation, right? Where the goddess wants the mortal, and the mortal is rebuffing the goddess, right? The mortal doesn't want any part of the goddess. Finally, the gods command Calypso to let Odysseus go. She does, and he washes up on the shore of an island called Phaeacia. And that's where we are at the beginning of the portion I asked you guys to read, at the beginning of book six, right? We are on the island of Phaeacia. Odysseus has just washed up. And what's his condition when he washes up here? Okay, yeah. He's naked. <clears throat> yeah, he's not very clean, right? But he's alive. And so we have this scene in which he wakes up on page 399. But when she was about to fold the clothes, yoke the mules and head back home, the gray-eyed one sprung her plan, right? The gray-eyed one is the goddess Athena. Um, this is the epithet that's always applied to her, gray-eyed Athena, flashing-eyed Athena, right? Usually something to do with the eyes. Odysseus would wake up, see the lovely girl, and she would lead him to the Phaeacian city. The princess threw the ball to one of the girls, but it sailed wide into deep swirling water. The girl screamed and Odysseus awoke. Sitting up, he tried to puzzle it out. What kind of land have I come to now? Are the natives wild and lawless sad savages or God-fearing men who welcome strangers? That sounded like girls screaming or the cry of the spirit women who hold the high peaks, the river wells and the grassy meadows. Can it be I am close to human voices? I'll go and have a look and see for myself. With that, Odysseus emerged from the bushes he broke off a leafy, a leafy branch from the undergrowth and held it before him to cover himself. So, why doesn't he just run headlong out towards these voices? Uh, yeah. Well, one, he doesn't want to scare whoever it is. Two, he doesn't know 
where these noises are actually coming from, right? We have some we have don't have the tail yet of where exactly he's been and what he what exactly he's been up to, but we do have a sense that he has learned some lessons from it, right? Are these wild and lawless savages or God-fearing men who welcome strangers, right? Could be one or the other here. These could be spirits who want to lure me to my doom. So the key note in Odysseus's character tends to be caution. Right. He's not a hero who is renowned for his fighting prowess so much as he is renowned for his cleverness. Right. He was the great strategist of the Greek army. The thinker, the persuader. Not so much the warrior. Right. If you compare a hero like Odysseus to a hero like Achilles, Right, Achilles in the Iliad right, is a demigod. He's virtually invulnerable. And when he meets with a problem he can't immediately solve, right, his usual response is to punch it until it falls down. Right. Odysseus doesn't do that. Odysseus doesn't work that way. Odysseus isn't about brute force or brute strength. Odysseus is about conquest through strategy. With that, Odysseus emerged from the bushes. He broke off a leafy branch in the undergrowth and held it before, to before him to cover himself. A weathered mountain lion steps into a clearing, confident in his strength, eyes glowing. The wind and rain have let up, and he's hunting cattle, sheep, or wild deer, but is hungry enough to jump the stone walls of the animal pens. So Odysseus advanced upon these ringleted girls, naked as he was. What choice did he have? He was a frightening sight, disfigured with brine, and the girls fluttered off to the jutting beaches. Only Alcinous' daughter stayed. Athena put courage in her heart and stopped her trembling. She held her ground, and Odysseus wondered how to approach this beautiful girl. Should he fall at, his knee, fall at her knees, or keep his distance and ask her with honeyed words to show him the way to the city and give him some clothes? He thought it over and decided it was better to keep his distance and not take the chance of offending the girl by touching her knees. So he started this soft and winning speech. Now, what's going on with the whole thing about the knees here? Why does he keep talking about touching your knees? Does anybody know? It, it is in a way, yeah. Like the idea, like when you are bowing down and hugging someone around the knees, like prostrating yourself before someone, it is a gesture of submission, right? You're putting yourself in their power. But in Greek culture, Bending down before someone and touching their knees actually was a very specific kind of ritual gesture. Um, it's called uh, the gesture of the suppliant. Essentially, what what this means, right? You are putting someone, you're putting yourself in someone else's power, and asking them to help you. And if you refuse someone who makes this gesture to you, who puts themselves in your power and asks for your help, then you have committed a sin um, against Zeus who guards travelers and strangers, right? So what would be the risk for Odysseus in making this particular gesture to an unfamiliar person? That's, that's the thing. He doesn't know if they fear the gods or are barbarians, right? The Greeks tended to divide the world up into two kinds of people, right? Greeks and savage, naked, howling barbarians. You could tell if someone was civilized, if you're an ancient Greek, by observing whether or not they followed Greek customs. So if the people on this island are, by Odysseus' standard, civilized, then yes, they will follow this custom. 
If they are not, they won't and won't recognize the gesture. Right, so he has to find a safer way first of determining whether or not these people are what he would consider civilized, right? Whether they follow Greek laws, Greek rules, Greek social mores, right? And it's much easier and safer, he determines, to find that out through conversation than through making the wrong gesture and making a misstep immediately, right? I implore you, lady, are you a goddess or mortal? If you are one of heaven's divinities, I think you are most like Zeus's daughter Artemis. You have her looks, her stature, her form. If you are immortal and live on this earth, thrice blessed is your father, your queenly mother, thrice blessed your brothers. Their hearts must always be warm with happiness when they look at you, just blossoming as you enter the dance. And happiest of all will be the lucky man who takes you home with a cartload of gifts. I have never seen anyone like you. Now I think it's important his opening little speech here, which goddess he compares this girl to. Any of you know anything about the goddess Artemis? What she's the goddess of, what her characteristics were? She's the goddess of the hunt, and mm -hmm. um, she protects virgins. Yes. That's the important thing here, right? The goddess of chastity. The goddess who, the eternal virgin goddess who protects virgins. Now, why would he invoke this particular goddess as he is sort of stalking a beach naked and dripping with seawater towards a group of young girls? So that she's not afraid that he'll like try to break her or something. Exactly, yeah. He's trying to signal honorable intent here, right? I think you are most like the inviolate goddess Artemis. Right? You're most like the virgin goddess, the goddess of chastity. So essentially what he said, like, don't be afraid of me, right? I'm going to keep my distance. I am not a sexual threat. And white-armed Nausicaa answered him, Stranger, you do not seem to be a bad man or a fool. Zeus himself, the Olympian god, sends happiness to good men and bad men both, to each as he wills. To you he has given these troubles, but you have no choice but to bear. But now, since you have come to our country, you shall not lack clothing nor anything needed by a sore tried suppliant who presents himself. I will show you where the city is and tell you that the people here are called Phaeacians. This is their country, and I am the daughter of great-hearted Alcinous, the Phaeacians' lord. Okay, so what has his careful approach, what information has he managed to get from this girl by being careful and by not just throwing himself at her feet right away? Okay, yep, she's the king's daughter. And what evidence of civilization here does she present? She does say, she does realize the word, like says the word suppliant. Okay, yeah, she specifically uses the word suppliant, right? That we should not refuse a suppliant. What does she mention the Phaeacians have? Okay, well, clothes, right? That's one thing. It's in desperate of pants. Yeah, they have a city. They do have a city. That's mark number one of civilization, right? And how do they treat guests? They provide whatever they need. Yes. They welcome guests taken strange. They practice hospitality, right? Hospitality was for the ancient Greeks a sort of sacred rule, right? If someone come, came to you and needed help, it was incumbent upon you to give that person the help they needed within reason, right? If 
the help they needed or requested exceeded your ability uh, to provide, then you were no, not obligated to help them. And if someone tried to take advantage of your hospitality, you were not obligated to help them. But if someone came to you in genuine need, say a foreigner washed up on the shore, naked and covered with salt water, then yeah, you were supposed to take that person in and help them. That was your sacred duty, and it was an offense to the gods if you did not. Doesn't that go back to the whole, they believe the gods would come down to earth, and any stranger you needed to treat right because you didn't know if that was a god? There are myths in which that happens. Um, I don't know that people literally believed mm -hmm. that gods sometimes came to earth, walked around, and tested people in that way. But there are myths, uh, particularly the god of the gods Zeus and Hermes, um, who were the special protectors of strangers and of travelers, um, assuming mortal form and going around testing people to see if they actually followed the rules or not. Um, this is one thing to remember again about most ancient world gods, is that they're not omniscient. They can see and they can perceive more than a normal human can, but they don't know everything. Right, so they can be tricked, they can be deceived, um, and they do sometimes need to go out amongst the people to actually find out what's going on. But yeah, the consequences for deceiving them were usually not, um, not pleasant. You know, things like uh, you know, being forced to uh, endlessly push a rock up a hill um, only to have it always fall back to the bottom when you get to the top. Or having your liver eaten every day by a giant eagle. Yeah, that's, uh, these are the sorts of things that happened if you tricked the gods and thought you got away with it. Um, <clears throat> right. So because they have a city, because they practice hospitality, these are good indicators to Odysseus that he's dealing with civilized people, with people who follow Greek customs, right? Most ancient cities were built around what was called a palace culture. So there would be a palace complex in the center of the city, which was kind of the seat of all administration, right? The king and most of his important uh, the king the king and his family lived there, and most of his important officials worked out of this central palace. Um, and they often uh, began actually sort of like gathering places like for storing grain. The central place for storing grain ultimately becomes the place where justice and goods are meted out to the people. So if he gets into the city and finds the Phaeacians have a palace, that's a pretty good indicator once again, that they are, by his standards, uh, civilized. Now, one other thing, just sort of quickly to note about um, most of the ancient Greek ep epics and most of the heroes of ancient Greek myth, um, the, the Greece that we're familiar with, sort of historically, the Greece we know most about, um, is the Greece of sort of roughly 6th century Athens. Right. This is when you know the great Greek philosophers were active, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. Um, this was when um, the government of Athens was, they call it democracy, but we might not really regard it as all that democratic, right? If you were a freeborn citizen of a certain age, um, you were permitted to vote on all matters of civic interest, um, but most of us in this room would not have qualified for various reasons. 
Um, so this is the Greece in which a lot of these myths are circulating, but they actually describe a much earlier period. Um, the culture that Odysseus and most of his companions would have belonged to um, is usually referred to as Mycenaean. Um, and this name is given to them largely because of discoveries at sort of an ancient Greek city called Mycenae. Right? That's where they sort of dug up most of these artifacts and you know, found evidence of the language that these people spoke, that sort of thing. And the Mycenaeans are probably best thought of as proto-Greeks. Right, it's a Bronze Age warrior aristocracy. So, <clears throat> what we would regard as probably a kind of might makes right culture, right? You have um, a warrior elite with bronze armor, bronze okay. weapons um, that rules by force. So that's the culture that's being described in the Odyssey and in other ancient Greek myths. And yet there is this sort of, we see this kind of striving towards something better and more ordered and more stable, more peaceful in these epics as well. I think this is part of the interest that Odysseus has in the Phaeacians. Okay, so once he's offered hospitality by, Nau by Nausicaa, right? He, okay, she tells him about the city and about her people what does she then make sure he gets? Clothes and food, and what else? A bath. Right? <clears throat> we have the hero's bath happening again. Much as we saw in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And whenever Gilgamesh or Enkidu took a bath and put on new clothes, what did that usually indicate? Yeah, the change in state, change in state, right? Change in status. So Odysseus here is washing away all of the sea salt, right? His journeys by ocean are almost at an end here. Right? He is no longer Odysseus, the homeless wanderer. He is Odysseus, the returning king of Ithaca. And the way he looks after the bath demonstrates that, right, to anybody who's willing to look. Right. The girls went off and talked with Nausicaa, and Odysseus rinsed off with river water all the brine that caked his shoulders and back, and he scrubbed the salty scruff from his scalp. He finished his bath, rubbed himself down with oil, and put on the clothes the maiden had given him. Then Athena, born from Zeus, made him look taller and more muscled, and made his hair tumble down his head like hyacinth flowers. Imagine a craftsman overlaying silver with pure gold. He has learned his art from Pallas Athena and Lord Hephaestus, and creates worth works of breathtaking beauty. So Athena herself made Odysseus' head and shoulders shimmer with grace. He walked down the beach and sat on the sand. The princess was dazzled, and she said to her white-armed serving girls, Listen, this man hasn't come to Phaeacia against the will of the Olympian gods. Before, he was a terrible sight, but now... He's like one of the gods who live in the sky. If only such a man would be called my husband, living here and content to stay here, well, go on, give him something to eat and drink. So now, Odysseus is capable of winning people over with his looks as well as his words, right? He looks as good as he sounds. Thanks to the, the bath and to some effort from the gods. And how do the... How do the gods seem to operate in this poem? Like hidden, but like hidden, but like spiritual, I would say. Like 
They're not uh-huh. really, you don't see them, but they're there. They're doing yeah. stuff that you don't see them. So we're going to give you a little push, but we're not going to do the work for you. Yeah, this is not quite the same way God's intervened, like, say, in the Gilgamesh epic, right? Um, in the Gilgamesh epic, like, God's show up. And, you know, they tell you directly what's going to happen, or they try to force you to marry them, or they send a flood that destroys your crops, right? You know, their presence tends to be really kind of immediate. In the Greek myths, though, yeah, we see here that the gods operate slightly less openly, right, and slightly less directly. Athena is off is often invisible when she shows up and helps Odysseus. And if she is visible, is she visible as herself? Yeah, she tends to favor disguises, right? You know, she encourages Nausicaa to go down to the river by you know, taking on the appearance of her best friend. Um, She helps Odysseus along to the palace in the guise of a young Phaeacian girl, right? And then secretly, without his knowledge, creates a mist over them so that no one sees them going to the palace to make sure she gets in there safely. Now, when they reach... the Phaeacian Palace. On page 406, there he stood, heart pounding as he took it all in before crossing the bronze threshold. Gleams as of the sun or the moon played over the high roof of Alcinous' house. The bronze walls, surmounted with a blue enamel frieze, stretched from the threshold to the inner hall. The outer doors were golden, and silver doorposts were set in the bronze threshold. The lintel was silver and the door handle gold. Flanking the door were two gold and silver dogs, made by Hephaestus with all his art, to guard the palace, and they were immortal and ageless. Inside, seats were built flush to the walls on either side, stretching from the threshold to the inner hall and upon them were flung robes of, a, robes of a fine, soft weave, the craft of women. The Phaeacian leaders would sit on these seats, eating and drinking, and they lacked for nothing. Golden statues of young men stood on pedestals, holding torches to light the night for banqueters. There were fifty slave women scattered throughout the house, some grinding yellow grain on the millstone, others weaving cloth or twirling yarn on spindles. As they sat, fluttering like so many leaves on, pop, on a poplar, and the finely woven fabric glistened with oil, For just as the Phaeacian men outstrip all others in sailing ships in the sea, so too are the women skilled above all others in working the loom. Athena has given them a deep understanding of beautiful handiwork. The point of all of this description of the palace is to show the reader and Odysseus that the Phaeacians are skilled, civilized builders and craftsmen. Right? They know the civilized arts. They're good weavers. Um, you know, they can you know, create beautiful metalwork. Right? They, they're beautiful paintings. The buildings are well crafted. Right? This is another good indicator that he's dealing with people who are not likely to murder him in his sleep. Right? They are likely to follow the same kinds of cultural practices he does. Outside the courtyard, just beyond the doors, are four acres of orchard surrounded by a hedge. The trees there grow tall, blossoming pear trees and pomegranates, apple trees with bright, shiny fruit, sweet figs, and luxuriant olives. The fruit of these trees never perishes nor fails summer or winter. It lasts year-round, and the west wind's breath continually ripens apple after apple, pear upon pear. Now, orchards indicate what? What else do these people obviously practice? Agriculture. Yeah, agriculture, right? Orchards do not simply grow wild. They have to be cultivated. And finally, when he gets to the center of the palace, right, he finds there 
Lord Alcinous sitting in council with his lords, and Arete, his queen. Arete, by the way, literally translates to right or justice. So the name of the queen. So the name of the queen of this island is right. The men are sitting around pouring out libations to honor the gods. And Lady Arate is sitting weaving beside the hearth. Men are in one position, women in another. This is actually another important indicator for the Greeks of what they would regard as a civilized household. For the Greeks, the basic unit of civilization, and really, really try to grasp this concept because it's going to be important for pretty much every Greek text we read. The basic building block of civilization for the Greeks is what they call oikos. Now, we know oikos as a brand of practically inedible Greek yogurt that is favored by John Stamos who was apparently the uh, most easily available Greek-American celebrity they could get at short notice. Um, but what oikos means is household. And the ancient Greek household was based on a fairly rigid and gendered division of labor. The parts of the house that faced the street, that faced outward, to which other people would have access, were the man's domain. So if there was a shop in the front of the house, um, if there was, uh, you know, say like an open dining hall or an ancient, right, you know, then that would be the man's <laughs> space in the house, right, where a man could congregate with his friends and his associates. A man, the man was supposed to do all of the family's public business. The man was the family's representative in public life. If you went deeper into the house, to the hearth and the kitchens, that was women's space. That was where women were supposed to do their particular work, cooking and weaving. Um, men who were not members of the family were not permitted to go back into that space. Men who were members of the family were permitted back there on a limited basis. Women were by and large not permitted to enter men's space at all, except on special occasions. For example, um, well, when men had their drinking parties, usually the women who were hanging out in the dining hall were not members of the family. Well, leave that discussion for another day. But <clears throat> essentially, what I want you to get from this is that the Greek households had both a sort of public, masculine face and a private, feminine face. And that only if these two were working in concert did you have a healthy household? And if all of the oikoses in your little city-state were functioning as they were supposed to, then you had a healthy society, right? This was a sort of microcosm of society. Household is humming along nicely, so will the body public. This is actually like not a completely foreign concept to us, right? We still, um, in contemporary American culture, tend to regard, you know, the nuclear family, right, the single family unit, um, as the basis of civilization. Um, 
personally don't always think this is a good idea, but you know that again is another discussion. So the fact that the Phaeacians seem to respect the laws of Oikos, this is another indicator for Odysseus that he's in good hands here. So when he shows up on page 407, Right. Odysseus, the godlike survivor, went through the hall in the heavy mist Athena had wrapped him in until he came to Arete and Lord Alcinous. There he threw his arms around Arete's knees. Right, He knows it's safe now to make that gesture. And the magical mist melted away at that moment. They were all hushed to silence, marveling at the sight of Odysseus, who now made his prayer. Arete, daughter of godlike Rexenor, to your husband and to your knees I come in great distress and to these banqueters also. May the gods grant prosperity to them in this life, and may each of them hand down their wealth and honor to their children after them. Grant me but this, a speedy passage home, for I have suffered, lo I've suffered long far from my people. And with that, he sat down in the ashes by the fireside. Now, why would he sit down in the ashes? What's he trying to demonstrate by sitting in the ashes next to the hearth? That he's humble. Exactly. Humility, right? Like, I know I have no right to ask this of you, but I humbly beg your assistance. So he sits in the ashes like a beggar so that he doesn't seem too forward or too demanding, right? It's a, a gesture that indicates, like, I will settle for whatever help you will give me. Right. So... Two more things that I do want to sort of quickly talk about that have bearings on that have bearing on things that we'll discuss next time. And both of them have to do with um, the stories that are told by the blind bard Demodocus. The first is this story in Book 8 about <clears throat> how the god Hephaestus, right? Hephaestus is the, do you guys know who, uh, who Hephaestus is or what he's the god of? George. Yeah, he's, um, he's, he's lame, right? He's disabled, he can't walk but he has immensely strong arms and he's the god of craftsmen and of the forge. Yes, he's the husband of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and sexuality, and Ares is the god of all of the bad aspects of war, right? Athena is the goddess of the good aspects of war, strategy, tactics, nobility in war. Ares is the god of wholesale carnage. And so Aphrodite and Ares are having an affair under Hephaestus' nose, right? And he devises this cunning snare, right, this chain, to capture them and humiliate them while he pretends to be away. So, why is this important to the larger plot of the epic? especially given what we've just discussed about the household as a microcosm of society. What's Hephaestus doing in capturing and humiliating his wife and her lover? Okay, yeah, he's publicizing their, um, you know, the way they've wronged him, right? But what else is he doing by punishing them? What is he demonstrating? Exactly, right? He's asserting authority over his household, right? He's setting his household to rights, showing who's boss in his household. Right? Ares is going to have to pay compensation to him. 
because his crimes have been publicly called out. This is very similar to what Odysseus' own task is, right? His house is full of these suitors trying to woo his wife. And his ultimate task, at the point of his nostos, his return journey, is to get back to his kingdom, to get back to his home, and set it right again. To put the oikos back in order. With himself in charge, and his wife back weaving at her loom, right? The other thing that this story points up, if we look at the end of it, page 420, and with that, the strong smith undid the bonds, and the two of them, free at last from their crimp, shot out of there, Ares to Thrace, and Aphrodite, who loves laughter and smiles, to Paphos on Cyprus, and her precinct there with its smoking altar. There the graces bathed her and rubbed her with the ambrosial oil that glistens on the skin of the immortal gods, and then they dressed her in beautiful clothes, a wonder to see. This was the song. This actually does matter if we're thinking in terms of the sort of larger points being made about ancient Greek religion. Now, does the behavior of gods in Greek myth seem to be all that different from the behavior of human beings? Not so much, right? They do the same kinds of stupid shit that people do. What is different, though? They're divine, they're immortal, yeah. Respected is uh, you know, maybe more feared often than respected. Like their consequence, if they do something wrong, their punch, their punishment's gonna be forever. Where mm. you know, with a human, I think you're on to something there, but I think it's more sort of the other way around, right? Do either Ares or Aphrodite really get punished here? No, not really. They get off more or less scot-free, right? Ares runs off to the wild barbarian kingdoms that he loves once he's out of the chain. Aphrodite goes down to her people who bathe her and put beautiful clothes on her, right? The primary difference between human beings and gods, as the epic seems to conceive, we see the same thing happening in the Iliad, which is one of the reasons we think these are the, this is the work of the same poet. Um, there are no consequences, really, for the gods. The gods can do all sorts of messed up stuff and not have to suffer for it. They don't have to worry, really, about cleaning up the messes they make. They can pretty much get away with it. All right, so let's keep that in mind, right? No consequences for gods. When mortals squabble, people die. When the gods squabble, everybody just retreats back to the corner for a little while and then comes back together for the feast. Now the other story Demodocus tells here I think is particularly important. Um, notice as well, um, that whenever Demodocus starts to sing, he is moved by the god, or moved by the muse. Now, if we remember Hesiod's Theogony, which we looked at on the first day, right? Hesiod tended to frame artistic inspiration in terms of a kind of seduction, right? that the muses would come to him and dance, dance a sexy dance for him and that would inspire him. The usual Greek belief about inspiration is that it actually comes from a kind of spiritual possession. 
right? That the muses actually come and take over your body. Well, that's I know it's it would have to be a hell of a dance, right? Yeah, um, Demodocus, yeah, is, is blind. Yeah, so that is that would be a, a hurdle. Um, but yeah, the the usual belief about artistic inspiration was that it was a form of spiritual possession. The god came and took over your body and spoke through you. Um, there are a couple of Plato's dialogues that sort of tackle this as actually kind of uh, it, one of the reasons why he's against poetry. So he spoke, page 424. And the bard, moved by the god, began to sing. Now there's another thing that has moved Demodocus to sing. Up above, Odysseus has made a request of him, right? I don't know whether it was the muse who taught you or Apollo himself, but I praise you to the skies, Demodocus, when you sing about the fate of the Greeks who fought at Troy. You have it right. All that they did and suffered, all they endured. It's as if you had been there yourself or heard a first-hand account. But now, switch to the building of the wooden horse which Apeus made with Athena's help. The horse which Odysseus led up to Troy as a trap, filled with men who would destroy great Ilion. If you tell me this story, just as it happened, I will tell the whole world that some god must have opened his heart and given to you the divine gift of song. So what is Odysseus revealing about himself in this request he makes to Demodocus? He was at Troy. Yeah, he hasn't said who he is, right? But he is hinting that he was at Troy and knows what happened and can verify the truth or falsehood of Demodocus's songs. So he spoke, and the bard, moved by the god, began to sing. He made them see it happen, how the Greeks set fire to the huts on the beach and were sailing away, while Odysseus and the picked men with him sat in the horse, which the Trojans had dragged into their city. Then the horse stood, and the Trojans sat around it and could not decide what they should do. There were three ways of thinking. Hack open the timbers with pitiless bronze, or throw it from the heights to the rocks below, or let it stand as an offering to appease the gods. The last was what would happen, for it was fated that the city would perish once it enclosed the great wooden horse in which now sat the Greek heroes who would spill Troy's blood. The song went on. The Greeks poured out of their hollow ambush and sacked the city. He sang how one hero here and another there ravaged tall Troy, but how Odysseus went, like the god of war himself, with Menelaus to the house of Daphobus, and there, he said, Odysseus fought his most daring battle and won with the help of Pallas Athena. The basic point of this particular story, the destruction of Troy, is that Odysseus is not just a builder hero or a civilizer hero, right? He is also a destroyer. He is also one who has gone and you know, ravaged cities, taken prisoners, killed the men, Right, it's a reminder, in a lot of ways, of Odysseus's nasty side. Of his potential for viciousness. And it's the weeping at the end of this story that encourages him to finally reveal his identity to his hosts, right? So we'll stop there and we'll talk about that next time and whether this is a sincere uh, moment of revelation or whether it's a cunning trick, a cunning move on Odysseus's part. But I do have a couple of reading questions for you for next time to help you through the last bits of the epic that we are going to be reading. So we're going to be reading books 9 to 11 for next time. <coughs>